Each year since the war that drove the Taliban from power in 2002, my wife Olga and I have traveled to Afghanistan to document changes in this ancient land. We've observed an experiment in democracy and witnessed improvements in security in the economy. In 2004, our primary focus was on the elections, but we also visited a number of poppy farmers as the opium trade was becoming an important issue in Afghanistan's development. Opium production is the largest, single, most important threat to the well-being of this country. According to the United Nations, 87% of the world's heroin comes from poppies grown in Afghanistan. The opium trade supports farmers, merchants, warlords, politicians, Taliban supporters, and smugglers, ranging from local dealers to international criminals. In 2005, the UN warned that Afghanistan is in danger of becoming a narco state controlled by drug traffickers. In response, the United States put $780 million into Afghanistan's anti-narcotics efforts for the 2005 harvest season. But the results were mixed. Only two of 30 provinces reduced opium production at all. When we returned to Afghanistan in 2005, we decided to investigate firsthand the impact of opium on the economy and on people's lives. If vehicle traffic is any measure of economic health, then Mazar has made significant progress in the last few years. Here, and in most other Afghan cities, construction is booming. The newly rich are building mansions. Warehouses are going up to store merchandise now available in stores and markets. Gas stations are sprouting up along the main roads. One sign of economic success is that the new money printed by the central government replaced the old currencies issued by organizations controlled by warlords like Jamiat and Junbush. With having three or four kind of monies in a country, I cannot imagine the future of that country to be good. But it was really a success of, uh, for Afghanistan and for Afghan government that they printed out their own money and now there is a money which all the world can accept Afghanistan by that money. But very little of what Afghans are buying is actually made in Afghanistan. Afghanistan right now uh, do not, uh, does not have its own products and its own factories. The drug economy is providing a very large percentage of the economic dynamics. So we have to find alternatives. Where banks don't exist, as in this country, Gold is the traditional way to store wealth. But now some people store their wealth in opium. I asked a local journalist, Case Fakiri, about the opium trade and its effect on the people he knew. I'm wondering about uh, the average person in Mazar who has some extra money. Can they make any uh, profit off the opium business? Yeah. The people, are, the people who have extra money, not only the businessmen or the big smugglers or big robbers or professional in this figure who has nothing else to do. The normal people who have other business like shopkeepers, like others who have some extra money. I know quite few people who are doing this. They're very good people. They buy, for example, if they have some money, they buy it. They keep the, the stuff at home for six months or three months or two months. 
they look at the market or they watch the market. If the market is high, they sell it back and they make money out of that. And how will they know what the price is and what the market is? Who, who, who do they talk to to know that? It's very, very easy. When, when the season, it's the season, you can ask a very simple man on the street, okay, how much is a pound of opium? He will tell you it's, today it is 160 and yesterday it was 140. So I keep track of the market, however, I don't do it. But I know every day when I'm on the taxi, people are talking about it. When I'm on the bus or when I'm buying something or when I'm meeting for something to get, people are talking about it. And I know from that. Not every Afghan can speculate in the opium market. But many profit in their own way, from shopkeepers to drivers. Let's recognize one simple fact. There are 3 million Afghans whose income is 30 cents a day. There are another 20 million whose income is between a dollar and two dollars a day. This is a recipe for continuous engagement in any type of illegal activity that allows people to put bread on their tables. The opium trade has clearly infiltrated all levels of society. It starts with the farmer, and poppy farmers are not hard to find. A UN report says that land under poppy cultivation in Afghanistan decreased by about 20% in 2005, thanks in part to government efforts. But in fact, production simply shifted to more remote areas, and combined with good weather, produced another bumper crop almost as large as the previous year. The price of opium is based on supply and demand, and is manipulated to some degree by the biggest smugglers who hold large inventories. With less people growing, you would think the price of opium you know, would go way up. Mm -hmm. But everyone tells us now the price of opium is down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can we go to the shows the fields where he used to grow? Where he used to grow, yeah, and maybe and maybe where he has some now. No, there's no flowers now, so there's not much to see, just yes. the little plants. Maybe if we see the little ones. This year they grown up poppies in this field and in this field in both. So let's let's see the baby flowers. This is completely opium now. I see. Yeah. Now, how in how many uh, weeks mm -hmm. until this becomes the flower? How many days from the flower opening to harvesting the opium? <laughs> Ten days after opening flower. Farmers here can't compete with the mechanized agriculture in neighboring countries. The poppy's drought tolerance and labor-intensive harvesting make it an ideal crop for Afghanistan. The gummy sap can be smoked as opium or refined into heroin. What is this? Oh, that's the blade for cutting the, the blade, blade for, for cutting the bulb. Yes. When I'm done, I'm afraid I'm going to do a lot of work. Check how much I'm going to kill. I'm going to chop a kilo. 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 This is the same thing. Uh huh. Done. I'm afraid I'm going to do a lot of work. Done. I'm afraid I'm going to do a lot of work. Done. I'm afraid I'm going to do a lot of work. Done. I'm afraid I'm going to
Cell phones have only recently become available in Afghanistan, and they're proving a handy tool in the opium business, connecting farmers with potential buyers. A field like this one can bring in a substantial profit. So this field that goes from here to the wall, yes. from here to the road, Yes. How many kgs will they get if this was all poppies? 70 kg, 70 kg. 70 kg, yes. this whole field, all at once? All fields, yes, round. Uh-huh. Why to Molum Meshagar, I got a war selection more because we put on me going to begin a guru warden, Takriban, after after the dollar mesha. Takriban, your Jota. Jota. Uh-huh. Oh, you know, a little more Pastakunum. But a field of poppies earns 60 times more than a field of cotton. Cotton, $120. Yes. Poppies, $7,000. $7,000. <laughs> While $7,000 is a huge income for an Afghan farmer, the heroin made from this crop will bring about $4 million on the streets of London. Drug economy is roughly $20 billion. The share of the Afghan peasant has declined. In 2003, that share at the farm gate was estimated about 1.2 billion. Now, in 2004, it was estimated 600 million. On the other hand, the share of the processors, but particularly of traffickers, and most of the traffickers, mind you, are not Afghan, they are international, uh, is risen. When opium is cultivated, there's a lot of force relationship. The cultivators receive money during the planting season in cash, but they're expected to pay back in opium when they finish. And depending on the vagaries of nature, they could be further indebted. Some, of course, will make money, but some others have been continuously losing their share. The American dollar spent on eradication far exceeded the money poppy farmers earned in 2004. The government might have tried to buy the crop instead, but that would have just made a shortage for the smugglers and driven up the price. The opium trade is not that simple. I asked Case how it works, how sap from the flowering poppy reaches the international market. And I know it's, it's easy to buy from the farmer, but then who will they sell it back to? How do they find the people to sell it? Yeah, the middle yeah. Man? There is, uh, you know, there is the network of people doing it. For example, if I buy some for my own profit or making some money, I don't sell it to the smuggler. The smuggler has people in contact whenever he is coming from Kandahar, whenever he is coming from Helmand. He knows quite few people, like two, three people. And in advance, before he arrives here, he transfers the money and asks the people to buy opium. And these local men have networks of several people. And then they bring and they get the money. And when the smuggler is here, he don't go himself to take it. He just have all the stuff ready, packed. And then he take it back. Opium is illegal. And because of it, it is moving the economy towards very heavy criminalization. Opium is undermining the central government's authority and may be a greater threat than the Taliban. So it's not surprising that the United States is encouraging drug eradication. In 2004, aerial spraying of poppy fields by the United States was blamed for making children and farm animals sick. Spraying raised such strong anti-government feelings that President Karzai publicly called for an end to it. Eradication in a country like ours is not going to what are the environmental consequences of spraying? But particularly, what are the consequences of spraying on human beings? I wondered how the anti-narcotics campaign was affecting farmers in other regions. In 2004, we visited these poppy farmers near Sholgara, just before the harvest. Their fields lined the main road. This time we couldn't see their fields from the road. Mm -hmm. 
به خاطر یا ترکاری با از 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 مثال از پخته نمونه از گندم نمونه زیاتر چپاکه مگه تو مولا میته خیر وقت داره که نظر به سال گذشته میگه شما تو باقیات یا تو نگاه کین از تریوکش نه خیر نگاه کده این تو نفره نگاه کده کی پول دار باشه مثلا ما کی بی پول هستیم من یک سر گندم ما به صدر افغانی I think that the Afghan farmers are incredibly smart if we assume that their standard of living is gone out. The key question is what kind of future you promise. How can Afghanistan's dependence on the opium economy be broken? No country has ever been able to eliminate smuggling. The illegality of it makes it too profitable. This is not Afghanistan's problem alone. The consumers are engaging in complete hypocrisy. The West is not doing its bit to cut down consumption. The West must either have the courage to legalize use of drugs or to enforce its uh, security apparatus. We need to turn the searchlight on how is it that tons of heroin are making their way to the West despite billions and tens of billions of dollars of expenditure on security. They must be breached. So they need to start strengthening their own security or they need to come to terms. As Ghani points out, opium does have valid medicinal uses and the crop could become part of the legitimate economy. For some sections of Afghanistan, we must explore legal cultivation. India is growing it legally, France is growing it legally, Australia is growing it legally. Ghani raised a third issue. How will the Afghan people support themselves without opium? What is critical is to recognize the fact that countries that have an average income per capita of $1,000 do not engage in production of opium. That's the cutoff point. Our current income per capita legally is it's about 240. Unlike farmers who hid their poppy crop or stopped growing it, some farmers continued to raise poppies in the open despite the government ban. Most of them had protection through family connections or by bribing local officials. هر کاری با خودی اگر آمیر و مسلم جمع خانم در دامر جان و استاد تا و دوست و مامینات اگر شلوار لاسم از بال خس اگر کماندان امنیت ما ساز بال خس اگر ولو سوال ما اینا با تنظیم آشته گیس یا از طرف علم خان شده یا از طرف امیر جان شده شلوار لام یا از طرف استاد تا شده. Corruption is rampant here. One U.S. official estimated that 90 percent of the local police chiefs are either directly involved in the drug trade or protecting those who are. Some people have told us that they think that General Atta uh, makes uh, a lot of money from uh, the smugglers mm -hmm. that pay him. Does, does he know anything about that? I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. I was told that I was in the house. بار میشد کدام سو میرفت؟ سری مزار میرفت؟ سری شبرغان میرفت؟ خب باز فامیده شد It was too dangerous for him to name names. He said مزار because everyone knows that Atta controls مزار through his political party, Jamiat. And that Dostum, whose party is Junbush, controls Shurbagan. Usually if it goes from Shibargon, so that Jumbish guy in charge, he, he didn't uh, wants to name the responsible guy. Yeah. But the Jumbish head of the Jumbish, was taking the commission, the money, the money yeah, the... and from Mazar, if it crossed from Mazar somewhere else, Kabul <laughs> or Kandor, from Jamiat was... Jamiat taken. gets the commission. Of course, who is Jamiat <laughs> and who is Jumbish? You know clearly. Yeah, because Fahim, he says I cannot, Atta, yes, yeah. He says I cannot I, name them. Too. It is shame for me to, to I defend him. Yeah. I thank him for his honesty. Uh, I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If the opium trade was that widespread and open, I wondered to what extent Governor Atta was involved, if at all. Provincial governors are responsible for anti-narcotics programs. The UN reported that production in Atta's Balkh province more than tripled. It called on the Afghan government to remove governors where opium cultivation hasn't dropped. But Governor Atta is more powerful than Karzai in this part of the country. 
He led the local Jamia militia as part of the Northern Alliance that defeated the Taliban. We came here exactly Last year, we talked ago. with General Atta amid heavy security and noticed that he had replaced his army fatigues with a business suit. General Atta, you have much experience and are well respected in this country. What role would you like to have in the next government? افغانستان از شوروی از خطر تهدید کمونیسم نجات دادیم افغانستان از خطر تهدید تروریسم نجات دادیم حالا می خیم که حکومت با ثبات داشته باشیم و ما تغییر مسلط بتون برو ما کارهای ملکی فرهنگی و سیاسی General Atta is now Governor Atta, appointed by Karzai to lead Balkh province and reputed to be one of the richest men in northern Afghanistan I asked him about the opium trade and corruption of government officials قاچاق قاچاق پولش میره به جیب قاچاق برا و نفع تریاق میره به جیب باندای حرفه‌ای دنیا قاچاق برای حرفه‌ای دنیا پول بسیار کمی که برای دهقان میرسه دهقان کل مردم افغانستان دهقان نیست در شک نیست که اگر بازار تریاق جریان داشته باشه دهقان اینا کسی ممانعت نکنه تریاق بکاره در هیچ شک نیست که قاچاق برا we're also told that many government officials are helping the smugglers because the government salaries are so low. دیشکنی <laughs> As we left Atta's office, I saw his new fleet of Toyota Land Cruisers, and I wondered if it was bought with his government salary or private business interests. What was clear was that Atta had made the transition to politician. When we saw him at the groundbreaking of a new girls' school to be built with Japanese foreign aid, he looked positively presidential. Like General Atta, his rival, the Uzbek leader General Dostum, has turned to politics rather than rely entirely on his militia to stay in power. General Dostum ran for president against Karzai and got 10% of the vote, roughly the same percentage as ethnic Uzbeks in the country. To neutralize his power, Karzai appointed Dostum chief of staff of the armed forces a newly created post based in Kabul. As a result, Syed Narullah, Dostum's top deputy, took his place as leader of Dostum's Junbush party. In 2004, we went to Junbush headquarters and met with Narullah to learn how Junbush was transforming itself from a military to political organization. I asked why his militia refused to disarm. <laughs> بلفیل طالب و القایده موجود هست بنان ما تشویش نگرانی انوز هم داریم که خدای نخواسته نشه وضعیت امنیتی که با وجود آمده در نتیجه مداخله بقایه طالب و القایده ای برهم نخواسته است It was clear that General Dostum would not allow the central government to dictate when it was safe enough to disband his private militia He would make that decision علاوه از بلای تروریسم در دنیا بلای دیگه یا مصیبت آفات دیگه وجود داره که او عبارت از کشت و زر و ترافیک و قاچاق مواد مخدر است که در این راستا هم جنبش به مسابقه یک جریان سیاسی سهم بسیار جدی در مبارزه علیه مواد مخدر داشت. What exactly has Junbish been doing uh, to do that? You said best efforts, but could you be more specific? 
و دورترین نقاطی از ولایت های شمال رفتن به فعل اونجا عملا در قط ای اشجار دست دادن و این اقدام کردن محفا کردن Norullah frequently took this same road between Sherbagan and Mazar. The opium fields were in full bloom and impossible to miss. We saw Jumbush soldiers in the fields. Despite what Norullah said, we didn't see any obstacles to cultivation. Warlords may become politicians in the new Afghanistan, but as the United Nations confirms, many have kept their day jobs as drug lords. Will the power of drug money kill Afghanistan's opportunity for a viable central government? If poppy eradication efforts are successful, will it prove fatal to the economy and the government? If anti-narcotics efforts fail, and they are failing, will opium profits permit the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and other private militias to grow stronger? Either way, Afghanistan's dependence on this fatal flower threatens America's continuing war on terrorism.